I didn't know anything about the business. I didn't do due diligence. The partnership was terrible. He was actually creating a syndication. I didn't know that. All I know is that I had money. He had experience. He ended up with the money. I ended up with the experience. That's what ended up happening after 18 months. Next, I'm your host, Josh Appleman, founder and CEO of Appleman Properties. Today, we have Gino Barbero, a dynamic investor and author, excels in multifamily real estate with over 2,000 units and $280 million in assets. He has co-founded Jake and Gino, mentoring and property investments, authored three bestsellers, lives in Florida with his family. Gino, we appreciate you coming on the show today. If you could let the listeners know a little bit more about yourself. Hey, Josh, how you doing? Thanks for having me on today. Uh, real quick, I'm going to give you a 30-second overview because we could be here for two hours talking about my background because I wasn't an investor. I wasn't a multifamily guy. I was the pizza guy for about 20 years. I got out of college and I went right into a business. About a year after I graduated, I opened a restaurant with my family. And it was great, Josh, until it wasn't great. And I don't know how many of your listeners remember the 2008 recession, but that just changed my paradigm. That changed everything for me and for my family. At the time, I had four kids. And I was saying to myself, how the hell am I going to pay for four kids working in a mom and pop pizzeria when I'm working harder and I'm making less? And, and for me, fortunately, I had tasted a little bit of success in real estate at that point, but I had tasted a ton of failure. And, and at that point in 08, I'm like, what do I need to do to become successful in real estate? What have other people done? Well, the first thing that you need to do is you need to take responsibility of your failures and your successes. And I decided, okay, I lost 172 grand five years ago. Why did I do that? Because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was honest with myself. And how many of us on this recording listening to this can be honest with ourselves? I didn't know what I was doing. I wanted to get into real estate, but I didn't know how. I didn't have a map. I didn't have a process. And when I met Jake in 2009, he's the pharmaceutical rep. We met because he was taking orders out of my restaurant and going to the doctor's offices and trying to sell pharmaceuticals, legal drugs. And he's like, bro, I want out of this too. So we just joined together in 2009. In 2011, he moves down to Knoxville, Tennessee. And I'm like, Jake, when you get down there, let's start looking for deals. And it wasn't like magic overnight. It took us 18 months yeah. because we didn't have the process. We figured out buy right, manage right, finance right. After we did our first deal, it's like, wow, there's a process. There's a map. You can replicate this and continue to do this. And after that first deal, after 18 months, we got the first deal. The second deal came three months after that. And then six months after that, we got our third deal. We're at 200 units. And I think the rest is history. I wish I could say it was easy. It's been amazing. Um, but for us, getting the clarity, learning the process, being diligent, not having that shiny object syndrome, and being focused in on one vehicle that was really excellent for us. And I think, Josh, ultimately, you have to believe in knowing that you can do it. I'm, I'm out there... Well, I just want to tell everyone listening to this right now that you can do multifamily. People have that thing in saying to themselves, I can't get into commercial. If a pizza guy and a drug rep can get together, move down south in Knoxville, Tennessee with Barbaro and Stenziano and hearing y'all ain't going to do business down here. If we can scale to 2000 units in several years, anybody can do it, Josh. It, mindset is is truly everything, and taking accountability accountability for for your actions and um, and having having a destination. I think if if you get clarity, the, sh the vessel doesn't leave the harbor without a destination. You get clarity, you can you can compound and double down. Um, so eighteen months, and within that eighteen months, you filled you, you got knowledge. You learned how to underwrite. You learned to find out what a deal was versus not a deal. Can you tell us a little bit more about? that path of, of what you had to go through in order to, to get your first deal? Well, I'm going to tell the people the path that they should take. The one that I didn't take, I learned after. That's why it took me 18 months to find the first deal. It was Jake and Gene on an island all by themselves. You don't need that nowadays. Nowadays, there are communities out there. For us, we didn't know what a deal was. And when I realized what a deal was, that's the first part of our framework, the buy right framework, the buy right, the finance right, and the manage right. Once Josh or Gino or Jake understand what's a deal for them, create a buy right criteria, the criteria based on how many units, the age of the asset. Let's get into median income. Let's get into unit size, unit mixes. Is it in a flood zone? 
what part of the city, all of those things are so important to getting your first and your next deal. Like you had just mentioned, having clarity. Most members, when they join, they're just like, hey, Gino, I want a deal. And I'm like, okay, what's a deal like to you? <laughs> That's the important thing. And I think the other mistake that most people make when they start, Jake and myself included, is multifamily is not MLS driven. The smaller deals are. But the deals, when you get to 20, 25, 30 units, you're not going to go on MLS and put in lowball offers. You need to create relationships with brokers. And that's what Jake and I didn't have early on. We got lucky that we found Rick Gentry, great broker, got our first four or five deals. We've done so much business with him. He took us under his wing and said, this is what you guys need to do. Let me help you. And once we built that relationship with that first broker, game over, everything changed for us. So if you have to understand that buy right criteria, understanding that. And I think the other huge difference in multifamily, in my opinion, is the financing. Financing is much different in multifamily than it is in residential. You have terms that, that don't go 30 years. They don't amortize for 30 years. Some of them balloon five. Some go to 10. Understanding your exit strategy. You can't buy these deals sometimes and hold them forever without having the proper debt placed on them. So understanding the buy right and the finance right for us to get in that first deal is huge. And understanding that brokers are the gatekeepers in this business. Yeah, brokers... Um want a certainty to close as well if they if if they have helped you close a deal and they know that you can close another one another one that's smart of them to do that because now they've got a buyer who can perform and it's a synonymous relationship because now they can go out there and more aggressively source deals because they've got they've got proven closers it's uh it's and you're building a report at the same time and you're building the company it's huge josh let me let me piggyback off of that real quick and i'll show you the difference between gino the residential investor and Gino, the multifamily investor. Hey, Josh, name is Gino. I'm looking for deals in Knoxville. You got any deals for me? Josh, the broker is going to say, well, you know what? I'll get back to you. Whereas Gino, the multifamily investor, and this is even if you have your first deal, you need to learn the lingo. Hey, Josh, this is Gino. You know, I'm a pizza guy. I've got a small business up north. I'm looking to get out of that business. I've got a ton of equity partners with me. I'm looking in the Knoxville yeah. market. Listen, median income around 50,000 bucks. I'm looking for, you know, 10 to 50 units. I'm looking for, you know, I like majority two beds. I mean, gardens are good, but townhomes with garages were awesome. Breezeways, not so crazy about. If you got no breezeways, great. You know what? Don't like flood zones. Uh, I like 80s and newer because I'm, I'm scared of that older product. But don't be afraid to show me older product if it's priced right. And I'm not really looking at a, a, you know a, you know cap rates. I want something where I can add value. I'm really a value investor. If there's some kind of distress or some kind of valuation through operation, man, Josh, I'm looking for that kind of asset. Now, what's the difference? The difference is the second Gino knows what he's talking about. I'm not going to be asked for proof of funds. I gave the broker clarity on what I would go, and I could probably even go a little bit farther, and I would probably share the broker you know, my one page or give them a bio and a background, but that's how you build rapport, by being serious, by doing what you say you're going to do, lay out what you're looking for, so when that broker comes across it, he's going to go, Gino, the multifamily investor up in New York, I'm going to send that deal over to him because I know he knows what he's doing. I know he has equity partners, and I know that he can close, even if he hasn't closed on his first deal, because we all have to start somewhere, but he's more comfortable with the second Gino than with the first Gino. Well, yeah, you gave him clarity of exactly what you're looking for instead of this round robin, and hopefully he, hopefully he bites. The um, mm -hmm. the buying right that is absolutely huge, and I think that the uh, the ones who have bought right in the past few years are going to uh, propel forward dramatically in the upcoming months. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's um, it's taking discipline, the uh, getting out of the uh, the fear of missing out, and uh, just buying buying assets based on their intrigue intrigue value versus a a future value. Um, the the one and you mentioned different asset classes you've got newer vintage that may trade at a lower cap rate and you've got um older vintages say 1970s or uh, or older which um uh, just by nature they have to trade at a higher cap rate because they cost more to maintain and manage um but we've seen that the the older the older assets are we're trying to trade at the same cap rate the same price as uh, newer and that's where people get caught up with just because it's a um just because it's it's a six cap doesn't mean that you're going to be bringing an actual return because you're collect you're chasing collections you're chasing maintenance issues a whole slew of things so buying right buying poor cash flow I think is is the biggest 
the, the most important part buying the buying for cash flow can you can you go into that a little bit more with us yeah i would love to I, I think the first thing is it's a function of what we call the market cycle or if you want to call it an interest rate cycle when i started in 2011 probably the worst time to start i think a lot of people would say that it was now looking back probably the best time to start start whenever you're ready but i am here to tell you there is a tsunami coming in the next 24 months Get ready now because you have to get into your market. You have to create your buy right criteria. You have to speak to investors. You have to get your business plan moving. And there is, you know, you'd mentioned buying right is critical, but a lot of people over the last two years have not financed right. We are long term fixed rate debt. We'll go into community banks with a five year term or credit unions with five year term so we don't get caught short like a lot of the investors have done with these bridge debts and all of a sudden their rate caps expire and their debt goes from three percent to nine percent and all, all of a sudden expenses have ballooned so that's another issue but as far as your question to buying right and buying these older assets there's nothing wrong with buying older assets we started out we've had a portfolio we've been able to trade up from older assets to newer assets because the market cycle dictates it when you are in a seller's market, these assets that are older are going to get more expensive in pricing. They're going to compete with the newer assets. So you need to say to yourself, at one point, can I reposition this asset, get higher rents, and still achieve my returns without blowing up my CapEx budget, that CapEx tsunami that these older assets have? They have cast iron plumbing. They have you know aluminum wiring. They have older roofs. We bought an asset back in 2021. It was a 1970s build but we paid 65,000 a unit. We were able to put about 15,000 a unit into it at 80 a door. That asset is a brand new asset. It's a 1970s, but it's basically repositioned. Yeah. New driveways, new roofs. Now that asset went from $600 in rent to $1,400 in rent. So, and that asset is probably worth today 140 a door. So I'm not telling anybody not to buy older assets, but you just need to be careful of the price points where we are in the market cycle. When you're in a buyer's market cycle, like I think we're gonna be entering, those are the assets you wanna get into, those older assets where you can reposition them, add value, and possibly your exit. You don't make money in real estate when you buy. You make a little bit of cash flow. You make money in real estate when you exit, whether it's a refi or a sale. You're crystallizing that equity. That equity is getting crystallized, and you're able to repurpose that equity. That's how you make money in real estate. And if you're a value investor, you really don't care about cap rates. You're trying to buy an asset where you can add money to the bottom line, to the NOI, push up that value, and then exit that deal, whether it's through a refi or through a sale. And that's what we've been able to do. We've been able to refinance probably over $25 million on our portfolio and just continuing to add and continuing to buy. And listen, we've bought over 2,200 units that we've, we've, uh, we've, you know, contracted out. We've bought out. We still have around 17 to 1,800 in our portfolio. We've sold assets because they've either become functionally obsolescent or if it's a syndication, we want to return capital to our partners with the idea that we're always going to continue to trade up and buy quality assets. Yeah. Does that yeah, make sense? One hundred percent. We've got a similar story with the nineteen seventy two build cast arm. It was it's a B area. Hospitals right down the road. Great, uh, great area. This was a slum. It became a slumlord property where it was the worst property on the block. But we've seen beyond that. You can change the property. You can't change the area. But mm -hmm. we all knew, from the entrance or exterior painting, everything brand new. And it. Uh, it bought it at a great basis. We're refinancing. We just got our agency quotes over uh, yesterday. And um, and we're refinancing. We're we're, we're refinancing in an, in an environment where a lot of people can't even figure out what the next move is because their property they bought it at too low of a basis, and they bought it on 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 future value. If if you raise a rent, you become cash flow positive. If you do this, if you do yes. that, and it's just and now it's in a tailspin. But we're we, we bought right. We we executed on the business plan, and now the business plan is coming full cycle, and now we'll we'll hold that thing until uh, till we're ready to to sell it or, or refinance again down the road but that's that to me is the way it's supposed to be that's that's real estate uh you don't buy it right and if you don't have the right debt you 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 get caught up in um in a tailwind like you just mentioned um very good points awesome but the um as far as older assets for sure you can find a lot of a lot of nuggets in those in that asset class mm -hmm. um someone who doesn't have real estate yet or multifamily, um what what should be their next five moves in your opinion well, I can tell you what I did my, my first five moves before I actually got into real estate. 
And I'm going to tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to tell you what I think you should ultimately do if, if, if you want to become a multifamily entrepreneur. Because you're not getting into real estate or becoming a landlord. You're ultimately wanting to build a business, a scalable business through real estate. And that's what change. If, if you're in single family, if you're in self-storage, it's the same thing. You're going to start small. You're going to be, I'm a guy. My name is Josh. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Josh gets burned out after 40 or 50 units and becomes the slumlord that he buys from. And Gino's going to come and buy that deal from Josh. Josh is going to go into the death spiral, like we say. So the first step I would do is, well, for me, in 2005, I had some money in the bank. I met a guy named Maserati Mike. Pulls into the driveway of my restaurant. Nice, nice gold Maserati. I met him through a friend. I invested 172 grand with Maserati Mike in a mobile home park. I didn't know anything about the business. I didn't do due diligence. The partnership was terrible. He was actually creating a syndication. I didn't know that. All I know is that I had money. He had experience. He ended up with the money. I ended up with the experience. That's what ended up happening after 18 months. So don't do that. Don't become someone like Gino who meets a Maserati Mike. And if you had a Maserati Mike story, it's a great way to learn. It's an expensive lesson to learn. You are either going to learn in the classroom or on the street. I've learned both ways and the street's a lot harder and you don't learn crap. All I learned of what not to do. I need to learn what to do. That's what propelled me to get into multifamily. I'm like, I want an asset that's a basic human need. I had a couple of small rentals. I like dealing with residents. I like the monthly cash flow. I like that stability. So I learned multifamily by actually joining two mentorship programs before I met Jake. Were they cheap? Absolutely not. Probably spent 30 grand. And to me, that was a lot of money. But I've probably... A thousand X at 30 grand into what I went yeah. to my net worth is now. It's not even a question. But not only that, I have a thousand X to my Jake and Gino students because they've closed over 70,000 units and they've closed over $4 billion and they've raised over $400 million. So it's not just me creating impact for myself. So when people look at investing in themselves, you can either look at it as an expense or an investment. I always looked at it as an expense until I met these two mentors in early 2008. When I met Jake, I knew how to underwrite. I knew how to look for the deals. I knew how to put in LOIs. Jake didn't know any of that. He just had hunger, willingness. He had a great business sense. He was the person with the boots on the ground. So we got together. So what I would say to anybody looking to get into multifamily, it's education times action equals results. I had a lot of action early on. I had no education. Once I put the education and the action together, and this third bit that most people don't understand, it's the implementation of the education, which most people don't yeah. get because they go on bigger pockets or they go on YouTube and do free videos. Great. What do I do next? Now that I know this information, I had my coach on that third deal. I was calling Craig every other day saying, Craig, what do I do now? Craig, how do I put in this offer? Craig, how do I retrade this? Craig, how do I create my, my credibility book? I had him on speed dial. He helped me implement the business plan early on. And I think that's what's truly important when you're talking about education and action. Implementation is key. So if you're serious about getting into multifamily or even single family, find a community out there early on. Try to resonate with that community. Try to see if they fit your values and your plan. And for any business, whether it's single family or multifamily, give yourself a couple of years to get acclimated to it. And, and don't think of yourself as a failure if you start and 30 days later, you don't have a deal. Remember, it took Jake and myself 18 months, but within five years, we had over a thousand units. So it really comes down to learning a process, learning the system, finding other people out there. And Josh, you'd mentioned a word that is so crucial. It's accountability. You can be all on your own watching some YouTube videos in your underwear. You ain't doing it because you're all by yourself. You're not holding yourself to that standard. Once I partnered with Jake, he had a wife and kids. I could not let them down. I looked at it as a business. I held myself accountable. I got on those underwriting calls. I'm working at the restaurant 55, 60 hours a week. Plus, I'm doing another 15 to 20 with real estate. I can't yeah. make the excuse 
oh, Jake, I can't call that broker back. I didn't do the underwriting. No, I have to do that. So you need the education, you need the implementation, but you also need the accountability piece, which a lot of people don't have or don't want to pay for it. Yeah, that's um, it was probably about the same. I'd say a year and a half to two years before before I actually got my first deal. And looking back, it is a blessing in disguise that I did not get some of the yeah. deals that uh, that I wanted to get so bad because I would have totally um, probably ruined my future in real estate because you want it so bad. You're like, I just want to deal, want to deal, get anything out there. And there was like a 77 unit in Lexington, Kentucky. And that was, I was so close. And thank God, the the world, the, the, the universe aligned and it just didn't happen. And uh, to this day, I wouldn't buy it today knowing all I know, but then I didn't know all I knew. So it was, yes. uh, but it's, it's such a learning curve and it, and it's frustrating, but real estate is truly, it, it the gratification is delayed on everything, but it's so worth it. If you just, just be patient, do it right, level up, get in the right rooms, get with people that have done there. Cause I, I didn't have mentorship and you know, go home and just learn until two o'clock in the morning and then go to the the company that's producing the income and just using all spare spare time to uh, to level up your uh, your knowledge um Josh, can I share a quick story with one of the one of the students that I, I interviewed one of my students last week and yeah, he made a very similar point to you the first thing is if you're not ready for mentorship I, I get it I wasn't ready it took me a while to understand hey listen now I'm probably mid six figures into my investment in education, wh whether it's speaker training, whether it's creating PowerPoints, whether it's learning how to pitch in to investors, whatever it is, I've learned that if I don't do that and I continue to learn new skills, I'm going to start regressing. But for me, just think big and start small. Don't start with a 77 unit like Josh. If it's your very first deal, it's okay to do a duplex. My first deal was back in 2002. I did a triplex. Beginner's luck. I should have stayed on that path. Instead, I went to Maserati Mike. So think big, start small. It's all about skills and acquiring those skills. I had a student named Derek Loda on our Movers and Shakers podcast last week, and it's very similar to what he said. Before he joined Jake and Gino, he was like, I had an 88 unit that we almost got. And he said, you know, looking back, I thank the Lord that I didn't get that deal because I didn't even know how to finance the deal. I yeah. didn't understand a lot of those mechanics. I was buying in the wrong part of the market. The unit mix was terrible. And it's just like one of those things that don't rush just because you think you have a deal. Think it through. Find out, like I said, what your criteria to buy right is. Understand the financing is different. Oh, and by the way, when you have the child and, and the baby's born, you know how to manage the deal. I mean, that's a really huge component that nobody talks about. Derek, if he had bought that 88 unit deal without mentorship, without our coaches coaching him how to manage that deal, he would have lost the deal six months later because he wouldn't know how to manage the asset. He'd hire a property management company that would be terrible. He'd blame the property management company when in reality, it's him not yeah. understanding how to, man how to manage the asset. So think big, start small. And just like you said, Josh, start leveling up, get into those rooms, get into the rooms that have commercial real estate, that have multifamily and start learning from those people. Yeah. I, I don't know where it came from, but it's the worst advice I've ever heard going back and thinking about it, but it's, it's find the deal and the money will come. Yeah. That is like, <laughs> that is so far from the truth. People invest in people. That's right. If they, if they trust the operator, the money will come. If yes. it's, it, it could be a deal of a lifetime. And the person presenting the deal doesn't know what he's doing. The money will not come. <laughs> and that's, but that was find the right deal and the money. No, not, not Josh, even close. Let, let, let's, let's expand upon that. You find a deal, the money will come. If the operator sucks, the money's going to go just as quickly as the money came. So that, yeah. that's what people have to understand. You're always sourcing for deals and you're sourcing for capital in any real estate venture, whether you're doing single family homes, multifamily. So source for the capital. Okay, that's the first thing. You need to have a substantive relationship with somebody to be able to get into the multifamily. And maybe the money comes, but make sure that the investors, you you're, have a fiduciary responsibility to these investors. Make sure that you understand what their goals are. Make sure you, if you understand what the risk tolerance is, make sure you understand that the time horizons match yours. I mean, just because the money's there, is the money appropriate for your deal? That's the more important question. And if you're not ready, maybe you find a team with a lead GP and you could possibly, what we say, co-GP and 
be part of that team and raise money for that deal, but you have to go through the whole vetting process. One thing that really infuriates me when I hear it, especially for my students, they join too late. They're like, you know what? I'm going to go LP live. I'm going to put a hundred thousand dollars into Josh's deal as a limited partner. They end up doing that. Two years later, there's a capital call or the deal goes bad. And then they say to themselves, I wish I had joined sooner. You're not joining mentorships just to take deals down for yourself because I think there's a place for a lot of us to possibly invest passively. But if you don't implement buy right, manage right, finance right to an operator who you're giving their money to, I mean, then you're going to end up losing your money. Understand the business. And then, you know, communities, mentorships will help you find those operators and vet those operators and make sure that you're investing in deals that align with your goals, what you're trying to accomplish. Well, and I think it's it's being acutely aware of of where you currently stand. So like you, you were a business owner before you got into multifamily, mm-hmm. operating a business, knowing a P&L, knowing a balance sheet, knowing the... The, op, the sense of urgency that a business owner carries just by nature. Yes. I, my, myself as well, I've, I've always been a business owner. Uh, so having that that acumen, you get that carries all that carries into multifamily. Multifamily is a business. So for someone listening that wants to get in real estate that doesn't have a business owner experience, bringing value to a GP to another, oh, yes. uh, bringing value onto the team, such as underwriting, such as is learning the skills, bringing the deal can be a way of getting into there. And then learning how to, how the business actually functions and works and learning the acumen, learning how everything else works on a real time basis, not just uh, you know, watching a video and, and how it works, getting the, the real experience. That is because there's, there's different ways of, of where everyone starts. Um, for sure. It's just, uh, it's, Knowing, being acutely aware of, of where you're currently at and then how you can add value onto a team. You've said it. You made a, a, an excellent point there. I don't want you to gloss over on that because that's truly really about entrepreneurship and business building. Multifamily is a team sport. There are a, are a lot of different functions that you need to do to be successful in multifamily. When Jake and I started, it was just Jake and Gino. We were buying deals ourselves. When we added the property management company that we were vertically integrated, all of a sudden you have that component. Then we added the education company. That's another stream of revenue. There's another component. Then we decided to syndicate deals and start raising capital. We had to hire and put somebody on our team to do investor relations. That's a whole other separate form of business, which is phenomenal. It's a great way to scale. We just stopped syndicating after our third deal because we were able to do you know deals internally with our own capital. And now what we do is we actually raise money and let our in, let our employees partner up with us. So it's a form of syndication, but our employees are investing in our deals dollar for dollar but understanding that it's a team sport and you can find your way into this team you can do deals on your own you can only go so far with the capital and with your bandwidth your goal as an entrepreneur and in any business if you're the leader is to drive revenue and how do you drive revenue by putting deals on the contract and by getting investors everything else you should be focusing on and let everyone else taking care of everything else you let somebody underwrite deals for you and help you with probably possibly the asset management and the property manager you're out there trying to grow the business now early on this may seem foreign to you and and i can attest to this when i was in the restaurant i was the pizza guy i was sitting in the kitchen washing dishes so I should have taken my own medicine. What the hell am I doing washing dishes, making 10 bucks an hour when I should be out front face to face with customers, when I should be trying to build the brand and trying to expand locations maybe, or trying to create physical products and really trying to create value through that way. Instead, I'm hiding in the kitchen doing $10 an hour work. Any business, any entrepreneurial venture has the same tenets. You're going to start somewhere, but as you grow, you're going to understand that you need to put systems and processes in, and you're going to really need to start focusing on what ste- what skills or what steps you need to do to draw to drive that revenue. Yeah, it, that's um, it, and we're doing ourselves a disservice by being stuck in the weeds on those items. We're doing our, ourselves, our employees, and our business a disservice because ultimately. If you're not out there pushing ahead and, and plowing down new territory, there's no growth. And ultimately that goes all the way down to the end to your mm-hmm. employees. The um, the property management piece, that is that is a uh, stuck in a weeds scenario. You kind of have it, it. We had to take a step back and, and take over our entire portfolio of property management. We just had to. We were not getting the communication that we needed. We were not uh, we were not able to push as hard as we wanted to push on. Uh, renovations on performance on expenses on all this other stuff that um, that was happening so we had to take a step back and and just realign and where we were we were heading and that uh, 
that is a stuck in a weeds moment. But once you put processes in place, right software, the right people, uh, you find out that that is truly where you can make money at in real estate is by controlling all facets of of real estate. And um, and it's a game changer. I'm glad to hear that you guys, you all are are uh, uh, managing all of your portfolio or, or are there some properties as third party? No, we're vertically integrated. We didn't know any better. So the first deal, we Jake started managing it himself. We, you know, we're kinesthetic learners. We like to do. And Jake, you know, was getting property management fees. That's how he got out of his job. After that second deal, he was earning probably a little over two grand a month managing these assets. And for him, back in, you know, 2014 in Knoxville, that was enough. And then the owner draws. So by, you know, 18 months of, of buying that first deal, he was out. And being vertically integrated, has some positives and has some negatives. Yeah. Now, the negative, unfortunately, is Jake and Gino can't do 3,000 units a year. But we don't want to because our right. metric, our key performance indicator is PPU. It's profit per unit. I'd rather have a larger profit per unit on, 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 on a portfolio than having you know just a larger number of doors. Now, the larger number of doors is great because you get scalability, you get a little bit of equity. So when the market's going up, it's over... A, a pro, you know, portfolio of 3,000 units as opposed to 1,800 units. But yeah. we understood that we wanted to treat it like a business. We wanted to be the Chick-fil-A of apartments. We did not want to outgrow our infrastructure. Now, this is all stuff for us. I read the book, you know, Little Giants by Bo Burlingham. You know, that, that was a game-changing book for me. I understood, hey, we all have different, different, I guess, goals, different values. And Jake and I just wanted to grow 20% year over year. That's what our... Uh, goal is going forward. And that is two to 300 units a year that we're buying. So that's two or three deals. That's manageable. That's okay for us to do. We like the vertical integration because it gives us the control. So when we were syndicating those deals, everyone understood that we were vertically integrated. They're like, hey, you know what? You managing your own properties, fine. But you don't have to be vertically integrated. If you understand asset management and you understand how to work with third party, you can pull it off that way. It just wasn't for us. We had just started from the very beginning, but you can do either or depending on the market as well. Some markets have much better property management. If you're in an MSA yeah. with less than 100,000 people, it's going to be harder to find property management. Understand that. Understand what the, what the business role is. And if you're going into that market, you may have to self-manage those assets. Yeah. And, and scattered sites, uh, smaller assets versus uh, yes. 100 plus units or 80 plus units. It makes it, uh, it, makes it tougher. But... Uh, Ultimately, it, I think it's capacity. You've got you've got deals, capacity, and capital is what the constraints are on growth. If you have the capacity to have the management arm along with the deal flow, along with the capital flow, it's harmonious. If you mm -hmm. don't have one or the other, you're going to get stuck in some degree. You can't mm -hmm. grow if you don't have capital. You can't grow if you don't keep up the operations or the deal flow. Uh, what have been some, some of the ways that you've oh, you've achieved to, to break through these barriers? Because at some point in time, you've got deals, but you have you haven't got enough capital. You've got deals, but you don't have the, the capacity. The last couple of years were challenging for deals. We were buying smaller deals, scattered sites. We were just bundling together and creating an office. You know, early on, I want everyone to imagine in front of them an imaginary conveyor belt. And that's why multifamily takes a little bit longer. On that conveyor belt, it's a five-year belt. That's typically the whole cycle for a multifamily asset. Your first deal goes on there. It may be a two unit. It may be a five unit. It may be a hundred unit. Your goal is to start stuffing your conveyor belt so that that conveyor belt starts matriculating, starts you know going along the cycle. You're adding value and assets are falling off the conveyor belt. You're turning that equity and getting into cash flow. And for us early on, we never we didn't leave our jobs. We stayed with our jobs. Our jobs paid our lifestyles and paid our bills. And all of the equity, all the cash flow that we made from our real estate got reinvested into the assets. That's why for myself, in March of 2016, I left the restaurant full time. I was doing this with Jake for five years. I was able to refinance these assets and I was able to put the equity back into buying the next deal, into buying the next deal. And that's why for us, we didn't run out of capital until 2018 where we're like, you know, now's the time to start syndicating. So we started syndicating deals. And as we were syndicating deals, we were getting acquisition fees, rolling those fees into the into the asset itself, and we're making money on our, on, on our portfolio as well. So we're using syndication as one strategy. We use creative financing. We did a 281-unit, $11 million deal, all seller financed. 
Oh, so wow. sell, seller financing is coming back right now. Yeah, that yeah. deal that deal is worth like thirty five million bucks right now. I was looking at it the other day. It just Jeez. absolutely absolutely crushed. Okay, Gino, Jake, you guys are lucky. I can't do one. Well, our very first deal was a twenty five unit deal, ten percent seller carry back, eighty percent bank, and ten percent down payment by us. That strategy is coming back now. But if you're not part of the game, you don't understand. Yeah. That seller financing is here. We just did a seller finance deal back in January. We had another one on the contract in March. It's there right now. So how do you scale? By understanding what strategy you need to use in what part of the market cycle we're in. So understand refinance and roll. Understand seller financing. Understand syndication is a great tool. And these smaller assets, listen, Josh, we bought a 22-unit deal back in mid-2021. It was a 12-unit, a 6-unit and a four unit. We just sold a four unit. We doubled the value. We sold on four units, right? Yes. 90 door. We sold it for 180. The six unit right now, we've got it on the contract, same price point. So these small deals can make you extremely wealthy if you have it. All we're doing is taking that money, bundling it up, and we're going to go and buy it. You know, in January, it looks like we're going to put a hundred unit on the contract. We're going to use that money and put that 100 unit on the contract. It's just trading up assets. Yeah. Once you understand the conveyor belt and not leaving legacy money to your kids, but leaving legacy skills and yeah. teaching them the business of real estate, because it's a business. It's not just buying assets and becoming a landlord. Understanding that conveyor belt, understanding investors, understanding all those strategies, you will become a much better investor and you're going to limit your downside risk as you lengthen, as you go into deeper into these market cycles. Yeah, that, that's huge. You refinance, pull out the equity, and then I'm assuming that you all are using 1031 Exchange to deploy that capital into larger assets. On on the smaller ones, we're not because we've got a ton of cost segregation that's going to wipe out the nice. the. Uh, but at the same time, we have a larger asset that we're doing. There's some there's some investors in there. We may have to buy them out because you, when you do a 1031, it's LLC to LLC, so we can do that. But we've got so much cost segregation from this year. We put 300 units on the contract, and yeah. we've closed on 200. We got another the 95 are closing. It's just, you know, when you own 30 to 40 percent of that equity, there's a lot of depreciation for those assets. So it's like you keep buying. The party keeps going, baby. That's what the idea is. Well, and, and you said 30 to 40 percent. That's huge. That is huge, Ashley. Setting up, structuring the deal correctly to where it all makes sense at the end of the day, because people can equity themselves out of a deal. If yeah. you like this 90 10, just say, I want to get, you've got a lot of time spent, a lot of heart effort, heart effort, and energy. Yes. And at the end of the day, it's fruitless if, you, if it's not structured correctly. I it's agree. Three to five years. It's got it. It's got to be. There's a balance to everything, and structuring the deals has to be has to be balanced. I I personally like 50 50 balance. I'll sign on the debt. I'll personally guarantee it if I need to. But there's an alignment of interest. I've got to run this thing like the jockey is going to perform. If not, I'm personally guaranteeing it that it's going to perform. And and uh, you all are going to come here. We're going to have weekly meetings. We're going to tell you the performance. But the balance of the ownership is um is key for sure. Um, very cool. Very cool. What are what are your thoughts on on where the market's currently at, where it's heading, and and uh, interest rates with uh, just the uh, it feels unstable. It feels like things are. It's really interesting because you know all these prognosticators, they've been wrong the entire time. You know, back in 2020, we were supposed to go into this freeze. Now, did anyone know that we're going to pump seven or eight or ten trillion dollars into the into the economy? Nobody knew. So you make you make that prediction that the market's going to crash. Well, it didn't crash. Then we're at a high. Then we're at another high. Then people come in with bridge debt. And all of a sudden, everyone's doing bridge debt. Deals should have slowed down. They didn't. Then inflation's transitory. Then the Fed decides, no, it's not transitory. We got to really raise rates at record pace and kill all these syndicators who got this bridge debt that we've been talking about. For me right now, there is what we call distress in the market. Two years, it was called value add. It's a sexy term. Now we're just saying distress because the market cycle is changing. I would say other facets and other other asset classes, I think, are in much bigger trouble than multifamily. But that's gonna see that's gonna you know get its way into multifamily with, with debt. Office is in trouble. If you don't have a yeah. nice class A property that's got a well capitalized landlord, you're gonna be in trouble in that asset class. I think retail in a lot of parts of this country are going to be in trouble, especially if you go into recession. Um, multifamily in the short term is going to have its bumps and bruises. I think there's going to be a lot of capital calls. I think syndication is going to be challenging because if I've got a deal and I'm asking Josh for you know some more money for that deal, but I find another deal that I can raise money on, well, I can't ask Josh to invest in that deal. That's the reality. So I think there's going to be challenges there. I'm hoping that you know rates 
come down for the economy. And it's funny because everyone's saying, oh, rates are going to go to 8 9%. Well, we see where the 10-year treasury is going right now. So nobody truly knows. All you can do is buy right, finance right, and manage right and look to the long term. We like to say buy right and sit tight. That's what we look to do. If you've got your buy right criteria, you're buying based on your pro forma, you're buying an asset class that you like in a great market where there's population growing and there are jobs and it's a stable market, I think you're going to be okay. I think that's what it comes down to, understanding the framework and looking at it long term. For me, multifamily is going to is always a basic human need. I think I think you know, the demographics where people are renting more and more, and you have these big companies buying these single family homes, we're becoming a much bigger renter nation. I think that American dream of owning a home is going by the wayside, unfortunately. So I think multifamily has got its I mean, it's got its own little niche where People want to rent, and and this whole rent, you know, re no return to office is, is going to kill a lot of sectors. It's going to kill yeah. the office space, but it's going to help us in multifamily because if I can live in Austin, Texas, and, and and you know commute to California and stay home, I've got the flexibility to rent. Why would I want to buy? Because I can go anywhere else next year and go find a job somewhere else. I, I think that um, FHA, well, they stepped up and made some new guidance too to, to um, I guess help with with ownership, but they're they're allowing four units to be financed with five percent down. In some mm. cases, three percent down. That just came out, I think, last month. But essentially, you're using the three other tenants as income to afford the property on with yourself. Yeah. So it's it's a way that I think that there's another path to ownership, but um, it's going to be further and further between. Um, I always think that the uh, well, I'm not going to get into that, but there's there's definitely a lot of dynamic things happening on the market. And I think that the Fed is seeing some trends happening that uh, might not be surfacing yet. So I think 2024 is an election year with things that are happening in a market. It's going to be a, a road ahead and um, just stay vigilant and and stay on the ready, well capitalized mm -hmm. and uh, just just uh, be ready more than anything. Um <laughs> Gino, we uh, we truly appreciate you coming on the show today. If uh, somebody wants to to reach out to you, learn more about your mastermind, learn more about your podcast, yourself, possibly invest if you have that if you have an offering, how can they get a hold of you? Just go to jakeandgino.com. And then what I would say is go to jakeandgino.com forward slash webinar. Every month we put on a free educational webinar. Uh, this month we have two students. We have what we call our closers club. Two students closing deals using the framework. And if you want the Wheelbarrow Profits book, we talk about the framework in the book. That's why we wrote the book. Just email me, Gino at jakeandgino.com, and I'll send you a free PDF copy of the book. Nice. Very cool. Definitely appreciate you coming on today. I, as always, look forward to following you, and uh, we will certainly talk soon. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.